Yeah. And I need my fingernail polish redone. Yeah, I was noticing that. Very Christmassy. Well, it's subtle. I mean, that's red and green, dark green. No, I wasn't going that way. Celery and tangerine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patty Robron, welcoming you back to Speaking Truth to Goodness, the podcast where we seek joy and purpose on our burning planet. On air with me in these recordings are my co-hosts, Jerry Atkin and Michaela McCormick, as we continue our enlightening conversation on creating sustainable and inclusive communities and the profound role of kindness in revolutionizing our society. Today, we'll explore the historical concept of the commons and how modern equivalents like community gardens and sociocratic community centers embody this spirit. We'll discuss the privilege of contemplation, the power of music and resistance, and the importance of play in building community. Stay tuned as we seek ways to weave the fabric of a more connected and empathetic world. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe Follow us on Instagram to keep the conversation going. And here it is. Well, okay. So now now we get to introduce Patty. <laughs> because she needs to be introduced at least twice. Because she does, oh, I don't know, all the work. <laughs> She's the tech person. She sets us up. She edits all of it. We just come in and have a good time and walk away. Right. So she gets introduced twice. Uh-huh. Or maybe three times because she brings snacks. (laughs) Well, I've been reading a lot about uh, various perspectives on degrowth. On what? Degrowth. Uh Uh-huh. ways of dealing with it and uh, why we got to this point. And it's interesting, one book I read uh, recently called Less is More, in part um, recounts a history of the world, particularly in Europe, moving over 500 years from feudalism to capitalism and all that was in between. I used to think, before I read this, that capitalism developed directly out of feudalism. But in fact, there were several centuries where the, the peasants actually uh, stood up against feudalism, the lords, and um, created, have you heard the, word, the term commons, the yeah. commons? They created the commons uh, out of just standing up against the the lords. And actually, um, between the demise of feudalism, capitalism, they they were they lived pretty well. I mean, they had they didn't have any luxuries, but they had what they needed, and they right. didn't work too hard, and nobody was telling them what to do. Yeah. My understanding is a lot of that had to do with um, the Black Death, the plague. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, if you have half the workforce, they uh, get right. to demand more things. They're not just a dime a dozen or right. something, you know? And all of the 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 trauma and uh, suffering that the plague brought motivated people to also have a lot of celebrations. Oh, <laughs> And obviously motivated them to work, to, oh, I don't know, together. Yeah. Yeah, right. they had to. Yeah. So I see the parallel with the sec- well, the depression of the Second World War. People had to work together to survive, and they helped each other. And then when you reach greater affluence and capitalism sinks its claws deeper into the psyche, that goes away. Uh, corporations really did make, sacrifices during the Second World War. Mm-hmm. There was something as a common good. Um, yeah, that's not here anymore. So, 
but it's nice to know that it's happened, and it's nice to know that it's possible. Right, and and what's part of what's instructive to me about that is that they, the peasants had nothing to begin with, and they created something. They created a more livable, kind, sharing community. I'm just, I'm really thinking about that because if you're living in communities that have gone through a war or a plague or a depression, whatever, that brings you together, now you're actually connected and now the well-being of someone else matters to you Uh because you're not in isolation, not just in a relationship to a feudal lord. Right. So how we recreate those conditions one at a time, I guess, is as good as it's going to get right now. Yeah, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And that was a lesson from what I read, too, was that it might have started out with single acts of cooperation and kindness, but it developed God, into this system of, they created a commons where all the, all the families had access to uh, places to grow food or raise their sheep or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I think um, when I was in Boston, Boston Commons, where those swan boats and every, you know, it's like a fancy place to be now. That is my understanding, that that was a commons, oh. just like that. Where uh-huh. It was a big green space that people could, you know, they'd have one cow in their tenement space so, to have milk. So they'd bring their cow there to graze for the day and then come and get it. <laughs> That's a great idea. Imagine that, sharing space. Well... <laughs> It's also the slowing down of time. Yeah. You don't have cars. You don't have high-speed railways. You don't have planes flying and destroying the environment in ways that most people who fly don't even imagine, including me. Uh And, uh, yeah. I have to make an exception to go to my granddaughter's graduation, but other than that. (laughs) (laughs) See? But that's wrong. But I, I have to do that. Well... I don't know. It's it's. I don't think you can say categorically that it's wrong. It could be more right. Take the train. <laughs> take the train. Sure. You're. I don't have a job. I can take the train. I'm going to take the train. But do you see? That's the thing. So many people are backed into a position where yeah, they do yeah. have a job that they have to be at, right. Right. and they get just a little pittance of time yeah. to go not be a worker. Yeah. And so what can you do? But if you're going to do anything in that time, you fly. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a luxury. I think it's a privilege yeah. yes. to have the conversation we're having, oh my gosh, to think yes. the thoughts we're having. I mean, we need, I think mm-hmm. we always need to be clear that that being able to reflect and actually imagine a better world is is primarily a function of privilege. Mm. That it's not that I, un, other groups don't do that, but it's miraculous when they do, because they have to overcome the weight of history, like the civil rights movement. I mean, that's you know a great example. Well, yes and no, but another lesson from this period I read about is that they, these people. They didn't have anything to begin with, and they had been oppressed by the feudal lords for hundreds of years, and they moved toward a, a better place. They they had somehow they created a vision and they began building it. Boy, that's really worth studying. I'm really glad you're looking into that. Since you have you've created a kind of a, a map there, which I'm very comfortable with. You want to say something to get us started to put us in a particular direction yeah sure all right so last time we landed on the idea that small individual actions are what leads to the bigger picture and that most of our transformation as humans is going to be through person-to-person interactions and lifting each other up and since we recognize (laughs) that that means we're going to need to be working with people of all different ages who have had all of these different cultural inputs. Um, We need to figure out what small acts we do with people our own age, but also what small acts we do with people of different ages and understanding how to meet everyone where they're at. 
Uh-huh. So I know where to go with that. Okay, you can take it somewhere else, too. You no, know, it's like being present will come up a lot when I open my mouth. <laughs> Noticing, like I get to hang out with your 12 and 14-year-old daughters who are insane in the best possible way. To do that, I have to bridge several generations of change. And what does that mean? I have to just be present. I have to observe I have to listen with intent to understand, not just to let the words yeah. for response. Um, and in a, in a sense, that's where all of our activism starts, is by being with people, remembering what Harriet Tubman said, you know, we set up people free one soul at a time. So every interaction is the one that starts the revolution, and it's hard to hold that consciousness. Mm-hmm. And yet, at some point, it becomes something of a practice. Mm-hmm. So B- Bill, Bill Evans, is the first time we got together in that uh, XR, our affinity group meeting, um, came out to me. The first thing he said to me was, you listen with your whole body. <sighs> no one had ever acknowledged that before. I, there are times, many times when I don't, but when I'm plugged in, Uh I listen with my whole body. Uh And that's how I can easily find my way into the glorious minds of a 12-year-old and a Uh 14-year-old in all their extraordinariness. Uh So so that's where it all begins. First of all, is honoring all people, wherever they are and whatever struggles and, you know, and and acknowledging that, oh, that's part of the title, speaking the truth to good, speaking truth to goodness. Um, that's an advanced practice that comes after mm. learning to listen. Mm. Then there's learning how to respond. So mm. I don't know. It's I. After all these years and all this knowledge and information, I come down to uh, pay attention to people. It's like where it all starts. That's where it started to create the commons. Yeah. Mm. People going through trauma together, coming together, and actually understanding that they had a need for something called the commons. Well, we have a need for something called the commons. It ain't happening. The commons. Mm. Yeah, it's a beautiful. The just the the phrase causes me to breathe a little deeper. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. creating a commons. Yeah. So that's what that makes me think of, and. And you have always been good at directing us to the non-activist segment. Mm -hmm. Everybody can contribute something. And to create spaces for that to happen, we'll have to change the way we organize. Uh I'm I'm being quiet now for at least 30 seconds. Well, we haven't lost entirely the commons. We have things, and we've had for many years now, community gardens. Yes. Mm. Which are a remnant of that, or a, or a reclaiming of that. Uh, you could make the argument that uh, wherever there's a neighborhood center or association, that's a commons. Yeah. It's calling people together to connect, to maybe make decisions, to consider what direction their community wants to go in. So we have things to build on. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think I, I as, a, as an activist, um, have tended to, to not value that as much as it could be as much as it may be useful. Um, because I'm thinking about driving an agenda with the people in power, you know. And that, I still yeah. think that's necessary, but um, the people in power have not been listening for so long that we have to uh, do more about building it from the bottom, and that's where the person-to-person stuff comes in. So this neighborhood association piece, many years ago, more than I can count, actually, 40 at least, I I ran a neighborhood center in southeast Portland, 
and it was glorious. And Lee and I had come to Portland fairly recently, and so she was a director for a year, and then she couldn't take <laughs> couldn't take the bureaucracy anymore, and she left to do industrial sewing, something honest, which was <laughs> transformative. <laughs> um, we were able to do amazing things. We created like a tool library, which people could come, and we had older workers who would help them, and they were all crazy, and we had a daycare center, and it was, it was an amazing, I mean, we had a belly dancing class. <laughs> we had a... That's so random. Well, Thanks and even more said. random is, is a um, Parents Anonymous group that met every weekend to deal with their abusive practices. I loved them completely. Uh, they were so honest. So astonishing. Also, that was a commons. The structure in the city actually, I think, has been taken over by propertyed people. Mm -hmm. So that their agenda runs counter to this other agenda. Mm -hmm. So everywhere we go, there's going to be resistance to introducing what we think of as the building blocks of a better life for everyone. Mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. Not just for us, not just for this group, not that, right. for everyone. So it's interesting. I love doing it because I had to fix the plumbing when it broke and, <laughs> and uh, you know, paint the signs and do it all. It was, it was a great job. Um, and then we left Portland and I didn't get that opportunity again, but I had that opportunity. And it really gives me a concrete memory of how that actually works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So neighborhood centers not attached to the city structure are where Alder's Com Alder Commons. Have you been to Alder Commons? Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Tell me about Alder Commons. Yeah, uh, Alder Commons is, which is funny, they haven't used the word commons. Exactly. Um, it's a, a community group that started with an intention of supporting um, like families that are schooling at home or need additional support um, with childcare, um, to have a space that would be available to all members of different ages and demographics, uh, with a really focused effort on supporting BIPOC folks in various projects and efforts within that space. Um, they do all of their uh, decision making sociocratically by fingers of five. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a model. Yeah, yeah, they're they're really working to to do something cool. I I think some of what they had intended got thwarted um, by the fact that renting out their spaces was a much better way to pay their bills than to do what they had initially tried so hard right. to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, they they are making something toward that goal happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I was in another one on Prescott in an old church, hmm. which was extraordinary. I won't. For you with all the details, but again, these are these have grown up independently from both just the pressure within the neighborhood for things to happen, but also for progressive people who are organizers of a different kind mm -hmm. who want to be present in a community. Mm -hmm. I think it was just yesterday I came across this idea of people needing a third space. So I think it was like you know most people have home and work. But then that third space, I think for, you know, a long time, in a, my opinion, toxic way, was church. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so I think we are lacking that a little bit, something the, about that community space. Well, there's also tavern culture. Well, tavern well culture that's big. fair. But could we just say that, well, hey, there's all these church buildings kind of sitting around collecting exactly. a lot of dust. <laughs> I'm going to say let's sweep them out and uh, turn them into that community, that third, that third space, a community space, again, it just doesn't have to have the dogma attached to it. Right. Well, Prescott is in a reclaimed church, the Prescott yeah, community. Yeah, that's what made me think of it. But I've thought this for years. I want to buy up God. old churches and turn them into cool shit for people <laughs> to come and learn together and work together and repair shit together. And <clears throat> So yeah. at some point... Maybe not graze their cows. We'll, we'll actually do a little handheld filming of Patty as she talks. <laughs> <laughs> we have to give her a lot of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, one other thing I wanted to say. This just feels like home. Mm -hmm. This just feels like uh, this is our commas. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. our spiritual, political, emotional commas. Mm -hmm. 
and if everyone is invited. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about here is not something that other people don't want. They may not uh, have the same words to talk about it, or they may not even want to talk about it much, but just do it. And um, so that's part of, I think, the work we have in front of us is how do we invite people into a space that they're very, very, very possibly wish for but have to um, create their own paths to it and not have too much instruction. So when you said the word workshop, uh, Jerry, a minute ago, uh, the first thing that popped into my mind was listening. Not so much us talking, although that's necessary just to create a space, but I think it depends more on listening. There's so much wisdom sitting around this table. It's ridiculous. You mean listening? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. You mean like uh, in terms of creating this type of community, like a, a commons, a, a noob type of commons? You're saying right. that it needs to start with like listening to the community? Yeah. And, yeah. and creating um, exercises or, or um, games, other ways of playing with each other that uh, Hmm. get people to relax into thinking more about who they really are and what they really want as opposed to what their bosses want from them. Mm. It sounds a little bit like zany bits. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So do you want to describe zany bits since you're actually more active in it than I am? Uh Well... It was brought to us, to a group of us, by our friends uh, Susan and Bill, who have been practicing uh, as a form of therapy for many years, this this thing called playback theater. And uh, the idea uh, centrally is that a a group comes together and uh, one at a time, they share some personal story with the group. And the group then is asked to portray that in a spontaneous way. And the storyteller uh, picks who's going to play what role. Mm-hmm. And then they act it out. And, uh, and then they talk, they debrief it. You know, how did that come across to the storyteller? So the that then has been the springboard to preparing street theater Uh to go with our political Uh actions. Uh It is, in fact, quite zany. Yeah. Um, And the thing for me, because I can only occasionally participate, is I notice, look look at and listen, a very diverse, not racially diverse, but class who they are, coming together and having fun together. And it's like, that in itself is an intervention. Yeah. It, yeah. And to see how much it means to people yeah. to have that space. And as I spoke, technical difficulties were dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think how we get to the fun so far in Zany Bits is, <clears throat> is uh, through this um, attempt to act out somebody else's real personal story. And and them asking us to play uh, particular roles in in their story, and that means that we, the actors, the the storyteller has already made themselves vulnerable by sharing the story, but then the actors have to have to on you know sort of on a dime express what the storyteller has described. And that means maybe taking some risks with yourself 
expressing an emotion or playing a certain role that you're not initially comfortable with or you know so it it requires us to to take risk in a way and and we don't and we don't always hit it right and that's funny because we we're giving each other permission to make mistakes or to to yes to to express something in a idiosyncratic way that nobody else would do so while we're having other technical difficulties so I'll, let me just tell you how I think that pertains to what we're talking about today in some ways Patty what the hell are you doing in some ways put it back but let's think about it it's like what's the relationship between being vulnerable in a group of people and building a movement it's everything oh my god it's everything <clears throat> On the surface, it does not appear to have that much. But So I think what all of us feel is it's things like this that help shift the energy in a way out of our heads into our guts. And then that energy moves out in our work. Because if good ideas would change things, things would have changed because there are a lot of good ideas out there. Can I interject here, though? Please do. I'm shutting up now. (laughs) not trying to shut you up jerry okay so the thing that comes to mind in talking about zany bits and very outward types of of doing the work it occurs to me that uh not everyone will be served well by getting themselves involved in a playback theater absolutely style right and so this is where our diversification of how we're building a community has to happen because for me I classify myself as an introvert and depending on where life is at (laughs) I may or may not also feel uh, more vulnerable or more anxious or whatever and not be able to put myself out there in such ways and need to be more internal Um, but I don't think that precludes community and so I think whatever community we're working on needs to see that not everyone's extroverted enough to express through a playback theater style right or may actually be like terrified away from the group (laughs) because they think oh no i'm going to have to do that and that's not me right and so i mean it's it's not a small thing we're dealing with here again can i can i finish that one okay please please please. okay because the thing is we aren't you know we're not dealing just with age differences um, we're not dealing just with race and class differences. We're dealing with all of these personality types too. Uh-huh. You know, so there. I mean, we are wild humans. Are so much to try to wrangle. <laughs> but that's the thing. I don't really want to wrangle them. I want to like be part of a group that creates a amorphous cloud of space uh-huh. where people get to be themselves and say what's hard that day and know that someone will be like well hey i can help with that or hey i went through that too Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how are we how have we lost our humanity so much that i feel like that doesn't happen or if it happens it happens in these little micro ways that Mm -hmm. we have to treasure because it's all we have but i think Mm -hmm. that needs to be something that happens more and more out loud and uh-huh. <sighs> yeah that's where my words run out because it's the thing i struggle with is all of this stuff we're talking about exists in sensations in my body and it's not always easy to figure out how to turn those into words mm-hmm. but you're doing it right now trying to yeah and you do it with your art mm-hmm. i thought you were gonna say my arms <laughs> <laughs> Well, that too. <laughs> it is a call to arms of yeah. another kind. Not that kind of arms. Well, the waving the, kind. <laughs> the waving kind. The hugging kind. The <gasps> hugging That's, kind. That'll play. That'll preach. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Call to arms for hugging. Yes. I can see I can see a poster. I can see a poster. I know someone who can create it. <laughs> 
It's not me. So much to learn. And it's so, it's a long, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to mm-hmm. take generations. But, you know, even back in the political days, they would say the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. You know, we're in the single step phase of movement building. I'm sorry, I wish that weren't true. But I think we are. And if we don't take that step, it's not going to happen. And it has to happen. We need a movement to protect each other and the planet. So So here's the thing. How do we help our fellow humans to recognize that that is needed? Because it seems like when humans have recognized that need in the past, it took things like the Black Death yeah, for us to go, oh, hey, maybe we should do this different. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, well, let's oh. hope it can be done without something that massive bringing us together. Well, but in fact, conveniently and inconveniently, we're facing a similar situation. Now. I mean, that's fair. It's just slow moving where we don't see it every day mm-hmm. in our face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's going to pick up its pace. You're right. Climate change, you're talking about. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and I think it's going to, and I've been saying this for some time, that it's going to take things getting a lot worse before people begin to understand how we need to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of people. That sounds a lot like Lenin when you get right down to it. You have to heighten the contradiction. Uh, well, so you so, learn to take language like that and translate it into something useful. Uh, Doesn't that mean we need to be working right now, like we're doing, to have something in place to catch those people, right? Once you know, because it's not going to happen all at once. There's going to be a few here and there who are getting like spun off of the the mm-hmm. wheel of capitalism, mm-hmm. and they're waking up to what's going on. And uh-huh. we got to be a net, be like, hey, we're here. All right. Join us. We can do this. You can help define it. <laughs> That's the thing. I think uh, people maybe shy away from getting involved in stuff because they think as soon as I, well, okay, I'm going to talk for myself. This is this is how I do with groups. I'm not always good with groups because I have this thing in my head where if I join a group, I'm going to have to buy into everything they're saying. Uh, and I rarely do, you know? Yeah. Um, but that is also my particular trauma having been through a cult and church of high control mm-hmm. type thing. So I realize that, but I also realize that's a people thing, <laughs> right? Not necessarily a church. It's a thing that we do. Uh-huh. We, we come up with, here's our way that we do this. Yeah, the positive part of that is that uh, groups come together uh, because they're seeking some common ground. Okay, yeah. And they once they start gathering together, creating a structure and doing things together, they create more common ground. And that's valuable. I mean, that's the glue, you know. Uh, The difficulty is that it too often turns into dogma or or, uh, expectations of not going outside the boundaries. Or, yes, like it defines a morality that's specific right. to that group. And yeah, that is such yeah. a turnoff to me. Yeah. And I can only think I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's in, it's not just morality. It's, it's habits or ways of operating or ways of learning. Like most of the people in Extinction Rebellion here in Portland are not interested in uh, doing theater. Uh, and we haven't shared that enough with the rest of it yet to uh, make it possible for, for others to say, oh, maybe I'd like to do that too. So it's a process, and it's, um, it's a matter of continuing, everybody continuing to want to learn and to listen to each <clears throat> other so that those, those hard boundaries don't get built Mm -hmm. i i kind of want to jump in here though because i think that we may have this notion of or, or this impression that everybody could come to ways of thinking like this if they're exposed to the right information right we've talked about this i think before yeah 
But where I take that from that point is a recognition of how, as a culture, we have made it so wrong to be wrong. Yeah. Right? Um, right. Right. <laughs> no, wrong. <laughs> wrong, yeah. I mean, even if you look at being in school, well, school's about learning new things, right? And I will maintain that we learn the most when things go wrong. This is a thing we say a lot in my house. Other than science, I don't think we learn anything until something goes wrong. Ah, we might learn something and be able to repeat steps, but to learn, we learn when life sucks. But but we've made it seem like that's a problem, and so when we get you know red pen marked on our on our test, and that makes it bad, that means we get a bad grade. What? We're vilifying ma- making mistakes when that is in fact the only way we learn. That, to me, is such a big deal in terms of people being even able to engage with these ideas or to do something other than just protect themselves. Because they're so, I think so many people are in fight or flight mode all the time, just worried they're not going to live up to expectations. Mm -hmm. And when they're focused on that, there is no way they're going to be able to look at other people in mm. the room across mm. the street, mm. living on the street, and go, whoa, maybe we can do better for them. Because yeah. they're just trying to make it too. <laughs> we've, we've broken them. We've made them think they're not good enough. We've made them think when they fuck up, they can't, they're not good enough anymore. And that's, ooga, 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 ooga. Yeah. it's so destructive. It's so destructive. Uh, the words are just going to go all mushy on me now because I, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, it's difficult to speak when two people are, giving you shit-eating grins. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because there's a poster and it's, I don't like it, but it says, all of us know more than any of us. Absolutely true. Mm. It's just not catchy, but yeah. I don't don't you feel like, I feel like I'm so much smarter when I'm talking with oh, yeah. the oh, two yeah. of you yeah. than otherwise. Yeah. And as for bad leadership... Misguided. Let's not call it bad. Let's call it misguided. A style of leadership that actually won't get us where all of us want us to go. Lee said, you would never belong to a group unless you were the leader. And I had no desire to be the leader. But, like you, I was never going to take bad leadership. So if, if accepting bad leadership was part of the deal, count me out. Yeah. You know? So we have to stop making judgments we have to start accepting people where they are thank you for joining us for this episode of speaking truth to goodness today we discussed the essence of the commons as a foundation for mutual support and joy emphasizing the significance of each act of kindness in paving the path toward a better society As we reflect on our discussions about creating spaces for community, celebration, and activism, we're reminded that change begins with us in the small, everyday interactions that foster understanding and connection. We hope this conversation inspires you to find your own ways to contribute to the commons in your community. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more insightful discussions. And follow us on Instagram to share your thoughts and experiences with us. Until next time, keep speaking truth to goodness, because goodness is all around.